Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out. Now, on February the 19th, 1968, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood made its national TV debut. The show's purpose, as put forth by Mr. Rogers, was to promote good self-esteem, self-control, imagination, creativity, curiosity, appreciation of diversity, cooperation, patience, and persistence. And in this video today, we've got 20 facts about Mr. Rogers. And this is actually made in collaboration with our friends over at List25. Mike from List25 and I, we are co-hosting this video together. I also have co-hosted a video on their channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. If you like this, if you like that video, please do go over to List25, check the video out, and subscribe. Alright, so let me hand things over to Mike to get us started on this video. Many of Mr. Rogers' famous sweaters he wore on the show were made by his mother. Number 2. The reason Mr. Rogers started wearing his iconic sneakers on the show was because they made less noise than normal dress shoes when moving around the sets. 3. Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. In 1962, he received a Bachelor of Divinity degree and was ordained as a minister in the United Presbyterian Church and charged with continuing his work on creating and contributing to wholesome children's television programs which was his passion. Number four, Mr. Rogers got into TV because the first time he saw a TV show, it had, to quote him, something horrible on it with people throwing pies at one another. He further stated, I went into television because I hated it so, and I thought there was some way of using this fabulous instrument to be of nurture to those who would watch and listen. Five, he got his first job in TV as a gopher at NBC and worked his way up from there working on such programs as NBC Opera Theater, The Gabby Hayes Show, and as a floor director on the Kate Smith Hour and Your Lucky Strike Hit Parade. He ultimately left NBC, however, because he felt their reliance on advertising and merchandising was significantly undermining their ability to produce quality children's programs that not only entertained, but also educated children, which was more or less his original goal in getting into TV in the first place. Number 6. Mr. Rogers was a vegetarian. He didn't smoke or drink or seem to have any major vices. He also stayed married to the same woman until his death. Their marriage lasted 47 years. The only slightly scandalous thing that Mr. Rogers seemed to do, with an emphasis on slightly here, which he revealed in an interview, was that he swam laps completely in the buff nearly every morning of his adult life at various clubs that allowed nude swimming. As to why exactly he did this instead of wearing a swimming suit isn't exactly known, but it is thought it was simply because public swimming pools nearly always used to require people to swim in the buff due to the cloth commonly used in old swimming suits having fibers that would clog up the pool filters. Today, with modern materials and pool cleaning systems, this isn't at all an issue, but perhaps, as he always did it when he was a young man, he simply decided to continue it as an old man, despite it no longer being necessary. 7. Contrary to rumors spread about on the internet, Mr. Rogers was never a sniper in the military. Nor was the reason he wore sweaters because he had tattoos all over his arms and body, one for each person he killed. These rumors first started on the internet around 1994 and saw a surge in popularity after his death. Mr. Rogers never served in the military and was a pacifist. He also appeared shirtless in at least one episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which had a scene and a swimming pool. No tattoos to be found. Number 8. Yet another internet rumor that occasionally makes the rounds about Mr. Rogers, this one more than a little absurdly offensive, is that he began his career in children's TV after being convicted of being a child molester. The rumor often states that his sentence included community service on a kid's public TV show. It has also been suggested that this is why the character of Mr. McFeely is called that and why kids supposedly never appeared on the show. Beyond all of this being quite obviously false, even if you don't know anything about the man himself or the origin of the show, children while they did occasionally appear on the show, and Mr. McFeely is simply named that after either Fred Rogers himself or his grandfather. This middle name is in homage to his grandfather, Fred Brooks McFeely. Unlike on most children's shows, Mr. Rogers played himself, not just in name, but also in personality and mannerisms, changing nothing about how he acted off camera to how he acted on camera. His reasons for this were that one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody is the gift of your honest self. I also believe that kids can spot a phony a mile away. 
Number 10. Speaking of being genuine, Mr. Rogers, who constantly advocated accepting and loving everyone for who they are, knowingly hired gay individuals to work on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. While that wouldn't be particularly newsworthy today, at the time his show originally aired in the 1960s, doing so was decidedly outside of the norm, even more so because it was a children's show run by a Presbyterian minister. In fact, two of those gay cast members, John Reardon and Francois Clemens, became close friends of Mr. Rogers himself. More than that, when Mr. Rogers asked Clemens to come on the show after seeing Clemens sing in a church choir, it made him the first black person on a kids' TV series to have a recurring role. This recurring role was Officer Clemens, a role he played for two and a half decades despite his initial reservations. Clemens noted of being offered the role, I grew up in the ghetto. I did not have a positive opinion of police officers. Policemen were sticking police dogs and water hoses on people, so I was not excited about being Officer Clemens at all. However, while Mr. Rogers made it very clear that he had no problem with Clemens being gay and loved him just as he was, when Clemens expressed interest in exploring his feminine side, Mr. Rogers even suggested Clemens might try wearing women's clothing to see if it helped at all. While Mr. Rogers was clearly totally okay with Clemens being gay, he did in the early years of the show ask him to keep his sexuality quiet as far as the wider public was concerned. As Clemens noted in an NPR interview, it was not a personal statement of how he felt about me. It had to do with the economics of the show. Despite this restriction, Clemens still revered Mr. Rogers and noted two noteworthy instances that he felt really encapsulated the man. The first was during a 1969 episode of the show in which Mr. Rogers, who was sitting with his bare feet in a children's pool, asked Clemens on air to join him in resting his feet in the water, with the pair then singing Many Ways to Say I Love You as they sat together. Clemens said of this, The icon Fred Rogers not only was showing my brown skin in the tub with his white skin as two friends, but as I was getting out of that tub, he was helping me dry my feet. The significance of Fred doing that for a black gay man is not lost. I felt unworthy, like Peter in the Bible. Why did he choose me? Many years later, when Mr. Rogers was wrapping up the program by saying, You make every day a special day just by being you, and I like you just the way you are, Clemens stated that Mr. Rogers was looking not at the camera, but at him when he said it. Afterwards, Clemens said he walked over to Mr. Rogers and asked him, Fred, were you talking to me? To which Mr. Rogers replied, Yes, I have been talking to you for years, but you heard me today. Clemens, who had long felt there was something wrong with himself because he was gay, stated, It was like telling me that I'm okay as a human being. That was one of the most meaningful experiences I'd ever had. 11. In 1984, Burger King hired a Mr. Rogers impersonator to use in an ad campaign in which the fake Mr. Rogers bashes McDonald's for allegedly McFrying their burgers. The impersonator was so good, it even fooled one of the writers who worked on the show in 1971, Elliot Daly, said Daly, of course I knew that Fred would never ever under any circumstances have agreed to create a commercial for children. And to make the notion even more ludicrous, consider that the product was hamburgers and Fred was an unwavering vegetarian. But I was dead certain it was Fred I was seeing in that commercial. According to Daly, Mr. Rogers' first action after seeing the commercial was not to lawyer up or publicly bash Burger King for the stunt, as so many in such a situation would do but rather to call up Burger King's then executive vice president in charge of marketing, Donald Dempsey. Daly noted, the Fred called him. He never mentioned the commercials. Instead, he just engaged him in a father to father conversation about how precious it is for one's children to have a true understanding about the nature and value of their parents' work and how unfortunate it would be if those children were led to believe that their parents' work was exploitative or dishonest. After that conversation concluded, the phone rang at J. Walter Thompson. The essence of the message from the CEO of Burger King was simple. Destroy those tapes and never run them again. Burger King would also make a public apology over the ordeal, and Mr. Rogers held a press conference about it. Not to bash Burger King, but to clear up any confusion in case some children had been misled by the advertisement. Rogers explained, I have had a lot of requests through the years to appear in television commercials, but I've always said no because I really believe that the host of a television series should not use the trust which young people have in them by selling products to them on the air. Rogers further stated, you don't find things can happen when people of goodwill get together. Don Dempsey and I had a very fine conversation. He said I really had taught him something, that children might be deceived by such a thing. It was for those reasons that he said his people would pull it. Mr. Dempsey said his company would never want to offend Mr. Rogers. 
Number 12. 895 episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood were filmed, with the first episode broadcasting in 1968 and the last episode shot on December of 2000, and which was subsequently aired in August of 2001. 13. Mr. Rogers famously didn't mind if people recorded his show with a VCR arguing for people's right to do so in a 1979 case, Sony Corp of America vs. Universal City Studios, Inc. At the time, it was being argued by the opposition that this constituted a copyright infringement. Mr. Rogers was one of the few involved in television that didn't believe so and felt people should be allowed to record programs. The Supreme Court noted that Mr. Rogers' testimony was a significant piece of evidence that helped lead them to their ultimate decision. Specifically, Mr. Rogers stated, some public stations, as well as commercial stations, program the neighborhood at hours when some children cannot use it. I've always felt that with the advent of all this new technology that allows people to tape the neighborhood off the air, and I'm speaking for the neighborhood because that's what I produce, that they then become much more active in the programming of their family's television life. Very frankly, I'm opposed to people being programmed by others. My whole approach in broadcasting has always been, you're an important person just the way you are you can make healthy decisions. Maybe I'm going on too long, but I just feel that anything that allows a person to be more active in the control of his or her life in a healthy way is important. Number 14. When PBS was first formed, Mr. Rogers' passionate speech before the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Communications in 1969 nearly single-handedly managed to increase PBS's funding from a likely $10 million to the original $20 million that they had been supposed to receive before cuts were proposed. You can watch a video of his amazing speech. We'll link to it in the description below. 15. Mr. Rogers once appeared as a preacher, Reverend Thomas, on an episode of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman called Deal with the Devil. Number 16. Mr. Rogers did the voices on the show for King Friday the 13th, Queen Sarah Saturday, named after Mr. Rogers' wife, Sarah Joan Bird, Henrietta Pussycat, Daniel Striped Tiger, Lady Elaine Fairchild, and Larry Horse, among others. He also composed most of the music on the show. 17. Mr. Rogers once appeared on the Soviet Union children's show Spokonoi Nochi Malishi, Good Night Little Ones, and was the first foreign guest to do so. The show has been on the air since 1964. Number 18. Mr. Rogers didn't just try to teach children important life lessons and the like, but he also produced a series of specials intended for parents called Mr. Rogers Talks to Parents About X, where X was whatever the topic of the day was. These shows were meant to help parents to be able to answer any questions their child might have after watching a particular Mr. Rogers Neighborhood episode. 19. Mr. Rogers was red-green colorblind. Number 20. Fred Rogers died of stomach cancer at the age of 74 years old on February the 27th, 2003. And finally, we'd like to end on a quote from the great Fred Rogers. As human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how fair and valuable each one of us really is. That each of us is something that no one else has or ever will have. Something inside us that is unique to all time. It is our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. So I really hope you enjoyed that collaboration with List25. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe. Also, I made a collaborative video with them over on List25 all about celebrities that we dearly miss. You can find a link to that in the description below. List25 is a great channel, so while you're over there, please do subscribe to them. They're good friends of our channel, and uh, I think you really like their stuff. And as always, thank you for watching.